You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Inside F1 with Joe Sayward and me, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners, so let's be friends. Before we speak to the man himself, just a final bit of Miami admin. We have a venue for Saturday evening, so if you want to spend part of your Saturday evening during the Miami Grand Prix listening to a live panel with us and hanging out, now is the time I need to hear from you. Please email me with the subject line Miami to spanners at mistapex.net. Can't wait to see you there. But now we're going to speak to a man who has been reporting on F1 since there was hay bales and an actual guy on the track waving a flag instead of in the box. It's Joe Saywood. Hello, Joe. Hello. That's actually true. Not the hay bales bit, but the one about the man on the flag with the flag on the track. Yeah. Is it? When did that actually stop? Because that looked like madness. You would never have that today. I can't remember when it stopped. But there was a guy called Glenn Dix in Adelaide who used to do it until the 90s, so... (laughs) <laughs> um, it was definitely in the 90s that it stopped. Oh, I thought I thought I was making fun of you, Joe, but then it turned out it was it was real. That just shows how young and innocent I am. I have no memory of there being a person on the track doing it. Well, I mean, in the 90s, you were you were barely existing, were you? So- I was 10 at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, what do you think of the celebrity flag waivers? Because we get very mixed results with those. I couldn't give a monkey who waves the flag, to be honest. I mean, you know, who, what does it matter? But I think it's I mean, become some of a them thing. Look, some of them have been completely ridiculous, I have to admit. And some of them look as though they don't know what they're doing. But, I mean, how many how many ways can you get it wrong waving a flag? There's some people. Didn't someone drop one? And so pe- loads of people have done it early. Yeah. Well, they, they should be told. It's not their fault if they do it early because somebody's told them to do it wrongly, yeah. probably. And but um, there are. It's one of my one of my more amusing things every weekend when you go to a racetrack. You see people practicing with flags. And you think, what a very strange thing to be doing. I mean, uh, waving a flag is waving a flag. You don't need to practice. But they do. So there you go. And I think there was, a, there was a great one with Chris Hemsworth doing the IndyCar flag. And he did this great advert about his training regime for waving the flag. Look up Chris Hemworth, Hemsworth flag waving. I promise you that'll be worth watching. Um, but Jeremy Clarkson, he looked like someone had to nudge him, like he almost missed it. Uh, but that whole start procedure, that that finishing procedure, is actually part of the Grand Prix. So we saw uh, Dorian P Pin 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 Pan. I Pan. Sorry, sorry about that. Bad French. Doing an extra lap and ending up losing her race win. So it seems like too important a thing to give to a celebrity flag waver. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an important thing to give to anybody. But having said that, there's somebody next to him who sort of nudges them and goes, you know, (laughs) wave the flag at this point. Um, And if that nudger gets it wrong, well, you know, it's happened in the history of Formula One many times. They've got the flag waving wrong. Um, Nowadays, it should never happen, but it does. If I'm honest, Joe, I feel like now we've exhausted the flag waving talking point opportunities. We've completed it. We're done. So well, I might I'm go to, delighted to hear that our flag-waving comments yeah. are over, yes. So in that case, I might go to the listeners who have tweeted. I did Twitter today, Joe, because I know that you've got a big following on Twitter. Okay. So your Twitter. You, you, you have a love affair with Twitter on and off? Mm. Not really. I mean, it's there and it's got some lunatics on the other end of it sometimes. Generally oh, been... speaking, um, I have a, a, a very sound policy, which is anyone who's rude just gets zapped. And I don't argue, I don't even waste any time with it. And rudeness is something I define, not they. But, you know, anyone who who says that I'm biased or um, any kind of swear words, just zap, that's the end of them. They don't bother me anymore. So I'm happy with that. It's been ages since we've had a good Joe Sayward controversy on Twitter. Come on, Joe, get a getting gear. I don't. Nice. I really don't uh, enjoy them. But, I mean, I, you know, it's usually in recent times the most excitement has come from Mexicans and Spaniards who, who got very upset about comments I made about Perez and Alonso. I'm sure, but you know, that's just okay. part of the game. Some of them may be just a tad delusional about oh, their, their heroes. A lot of an online stick for thinking that Fernando Alonso did what looked to me like a very blatant break check. But people have gone to bat to hard. uh, Sorry, have gone to bat hard 
for Fernando Alonso that it that it wasn't. Now that the dust has settled, how how much clearer do you feel that that was something a little bit naughty? Well, I think it was entirely naughty. And I have done from the moment it happened. It's just, you know, some people want to find excuses for everything. Some people don't. Uh, obviously, there wasn't enough evidence for the stewards to actually punish him. Um, but there there was enough evidence for them to actually... Well, they did punish him because they gave him penalty points. So the indication was that they thought... And a drive-through. But, and a but, drive they, but well. they couldn't actually... They couldn't... Um, they couldn't sort of nail it down sufficiently to sort of throw him out the race or something like that. So they punished him on the basis that it certainly looked that way. It's it's a difficult one, what stewards are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And I think that's the problem. Um, mm. You've got to have absolutely 100% evidence it was a brake test. And, you know, a dab here and a dab there is obviously not enough. But three penalty points is a fairly major hit. Yeah. Which, which suggests that they, they kind of had him sussed out. And I've had some private conversations with people, you know, who, who truly get these things. And there is no question in their mind, you know, driver types, you know. There's no question. Whether they say it out loud or, you know, in public is another matter. But in private, they'll say, absolutely, it was a brake test. Yeah. Now, whether uh, it was intended to cause to cause George to crash is another matter. And that's uh, the intent, you know, to, to destabilize him, yes. To cra- make him crash into the wall is another question. This is what I said to Meg on the ringer that it it was like pl- when you're play fighting with your sibling and it goes a bit wrong and someone gets a chair in the face mm-hmm. and then suddenly you're going don't tell mum don't tell mum and and you're <laughs> sort of making all the excuses like when he started then blipping the throttle to make it look like he had a throttle problem I think that was classic to me was yes he was being uh, you know gamey and trying to do something to affect Russell behind but then as soon as he saw the consequences it's like oh whoa 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 I didn't mean that mm-hmm. I think no one's suggesting that Alonso was trying to Put no, I Russell don't. Think, yeah, I don't think he was yeah. trying to make him crash, but the fact he did, um, he did crash. Um, may it, yeah, may it, well, clearly it, it was as a result of what Fernando was doing. So um, I think that's why it was a bit of a sort of sketchy, sketchy stewards report. But I don't think there's any doubt of what he was up to. Mm, okay, excellent. Well, let's go to the first question then. Hopefully, this won't be too controversial. It's a box on Twitter who says. How much does Joe believe the reports from Automoto und Sport of Horner's position at Red Bull being strengthened further move the needle in the direction of Max leaving Red Bull? And his opinion, for me, Max to Mercedes is signed, sealed and delivered. I would like to know Joe's thoughts, however. So this is to do with reports coming out from the the Thai side of a meeting with Horner and the Thai side of the Red Bull group. Okay, well, I don't think there's any chance whatsoever of Max Verstappen leaving Red really? Bull before, um, well, he has a contract till 28, but there's bound to be a get out clause in 26. But, you know, if he, there's no point in giving away a world championship this year and probably next year. You don't do stuff like that. You just smile and nod while your family gets you into <laughs> trouble, say the right thing yeah. at the right moment, and then get back to winning. I think, so you- Ward, I, I think there's no question that Christian Horner has, has survived this you think, mess right. I think I don't think necessarily he deserved to get into this mess in the first place I think there's an awful lot of um, uh, things that have been said and done uh, that are for, certainly unfair um, and uh, unfair to everybody not just a Christian but you know this stuff certainly relating to the lady in question um, her being revealed her name being revealed her identity is just fundamentally wrong um, whether or not there is a case, um, yeah. In in France, they have a they have rules about these sort of things, which is you know that it's private stuff, unless it it isn't private stuff anymore. There's a point at which, if it's legal, then it's not private stuff anymore. But in, in, it's private, and um, what was going on, if anything was going on, because there's no evidence to suggest there really was anything more than a bit of flirtation. In, in real evidence terms, there's nothing. In fact, we don't even know what evidence we have is real or not. So, okay, so Joe, I will say that I agree with you with that. We, we, we don't know whether what we've seen is real or not. It hasn't been helped by the fact that there has been no just outright, hey, everyone, those things you saw, they're not true. Because a well, lot we don't of people know will... they're not true. No, we, who knows they're not yeah. true? Well, it would have been very easy to just go, well, those aren't true. They're fake. 
Because yeah, what but, we but saw, maybe uh, maybe they're half yeah. true. No, no, okay. maybe, maybe it's faked, but some of it some of it came from a real feed. We don't know, so so it's impossible for us to be judgmental about anything. We should not have instant judgment without courts. Okay. That's what courts are for, and that's why the judicial process has been built up over many centuries, as opposed to having lynch mobs. And all right, I'm going to push it. back a little bit, Joe. Just just a little before we get back to the actual, you know, what could happen. I, I, I just I feel like that's a slightly straw man position against what people are actually saying. So I think what does a straw man position mean? I don't know what the oh, expression. Uh, well, means, if so. you're debating somebody, you create a weaker version of their argument to fight against. So yes, if people are just going to like the loony f extreme example of we should hang him with no evidence, then yes, I agree. Yeah, that but that's if you not look correct. at if you look at the Twitter feeds at the time, that's what <laughs> happened. So. Okay. You know, I, 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 I just think there's something wrong with society when we allow that. That's all. I, really? I don't need to go into any more than that, but I do not believe that we need we should have stuff like that happen. Okay. Well, I will just counter on behalf of the people who, who would have looked at those messages and thought that that clearly indicated some wrongdoing and would want to know. The only question they would want to know is, were those real? Because if they were real... That would answer a lot of the questions for those people. If they're not real, then that's a horrible slander campaign that someone has created. Correct. But, but and, a lot of people will look... Yeah. I, I wrote something on Twitter uh, at the time. It was all happening, even when we didn't know what it was. And I said, we only know half the story. And that is true to this day. There's another half to this story, which I cannot... I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> and some people think they know, but... There is a second half to this story, and it is best not to be judgmental about the first half until you know the second half. I do not know what that is. So the interesting points from that politically are Christian Horn is not going anywhere. There's no chance of him being ousted now. That is my feeling, yes. And so what you're suggesting with Max Verstappen is almost that he do some quiet quitting. If you're familiar with that, that's it, that uh, modern no, meme. I have no idea what quiet quitting is. I think <laughs> he will go on winning until he gets his new car in 26 with a new engine. And if that doesn't work, then I can see him quitting. Okay, a new engine. Interesting. So no, no, with the new power units of 26, everything changes. Ah, yeah. And so everybody, everybody with a brain is going to have a get out clause at the end of 26 because then they'll know who the good, which the I mean, Lewis is better on Ferrari. Um, other people are betting on Mercedes, other people are betting, nobody's betting on Renault, oddly enough, but, you know, everybody's betting, but everybody will have a get-out clause at the end of 26. Even if it's not specifically there, it will be a performance clause that if you have a bad engine, you won't be able to meet. So everybody will be able to change at the end of 26 because nobody wants to be in the wrong car. So Basil World has a great follow-up question to this and says, are there any rumours for the Ford deal being torn up. Not well, with Honda, the No rumours at all. So I'll continue his question. With yeah. Honda aligning themselves to Aston Martin, but the Strolls looking like they're selling now, interesting assertion, would Honda not be a better fit for Red Bull and continue the relationship? So yeah. what, what is indisputable, though, is that Ford put out statements in the public that sounded a little aggy. Yeah. There, well, there's a story behind that, too. What is it? <laughs> well, say allegedly a lot. <laughs> well, I think if you knew if you knew who the lady in question's best friend was, you might know more about it. But I can't say this without implicating other people and getting into trouble with it. But however, there is a reason that the Ford story came out and that it was given prominence. And it maybe it shouldn't have been given the prominence it was given. Interesting. So that so no. So we can say that's definitely going to be Red Bull Ford. Well, if there's a contract in place, it's worth billions. And if Ford doesn't want to be there, a man worth thirty billion dollars, a man from Thailand worth thirty billion dollars, might happily say to the Ford company, Ford Motor Company, "Well, go away, then I'll find somebody else." And you know what? They'd find somebody else pretty damn quick. So, and the idea that Honda is going to switch and leap across to Red Bull is they're in contract. They have a contract with Aston Martin, so that's not going to go away. So mm -hmm. I think people need to understand that contracts, even if Formula One, everyone thinks you can burn every contract in the world, you can't burn all the contracts. Um, contracts exist for a reason, and they're already working together to make that happen. So 
Honda is going with Aston Martin, bizarre though that may be when the car runs. Um, and Ford is going to go with Red Bull. And if Ford wants to throw itself on the fire and say, we do this on a matter of principle or whatever, they can do that. And somebody else will take it over. But who's to say it's going to be bad because it's new? Just because it's new doesn't mean it won't be good first time out. Mm, but if I had to bet, I would say that that feels like a worrying prospect to me. So maybe is that explained part of the jitters from the Verstappen? Well, why, why would that be worrying? Look, you, you know, you, if you if you look at the the, the record of Mercedes Benz, you said they should be winning everything now because they won seven out of eight championships or whatever it was, and yet it's a complete disaster at the moment, isn't it? So you can't just sort of go along and say, well, yeah, because this happened, that's going to happen. It's a bit like 2014, you know, Red Bull has won everything for the last four years, therefore they're going to win again. Well, they didn't. Yeah, no one called that. I can't remember anyone calling Mercedes-Benz they were going to go and then dominate for the Lewis next Hamilton years. Hamilton called it. Right. Touche. Yeah, it's good. Now, that, doesn't <laughs> mean that, that doesn't mean that Lewis Hamilton's called it this time. No, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent of the time he's done this, it's turned out to be a genius move. So just, far, I'm, yes, yes, I'm and so then maybe fifty-fifty in a few years' time. So we're going to have on. I think next week we're going to get hold of uh, Mike Caulfield, who was um, recently the, the head strategist at Haas, but was also at Mercedes during that period as a strat strategist. So he's going to be talking to us about uh, some of the twenty sixteen stuff that went on. So that would be a good question for him to ask. Really, is how confident. How confident, what inkling did that team have that they they had really had something? So that might tell us, like, as we get to the end of 2025, are there going to be some smiles around the paddock as Williams know they've nailed it? I, I mean, the thing is, nobody knows. It's a bit like the start of any season. You know what the likelihood is. You know what the, you know, the rates of progression are. But you don't know until you all hit the ground who's got a good one, who hasn't got a bad one. I mean, it's the same with Alpine this year. They didn't go into the championship thinking it was going to be a disaster. Although there's some noises that they sort of, they're trying to claim well, I now. Think one, that one, they... Yeah, once the, car was, once the car was sort of built, um, then there started to be noises, a few whispers from within that things weren't great. But, you know, the fact is that you, you still don't know until it's done, done and running how bad it is or how good it is. So, you know, you can just base it on, if you work on everyone being 100% perfect in their development process, then you have to find people who are 110% perfect to close the gap. If that's, you see what I mean. <laughs> no, I was trying to do the maths going, can you do that? <laughs> no, you can't do that, but that's how, you know, you can do it, like having parallel schemes. Some teams in the past have gone to, uh, completely parallel design teams, so that one, you know, one is working on one thing while the, while the other one's working on the next year's one. These kind of things, but with the with the cost cap these days, it's much more difficult to do that. So what tends to happen, or what will tend to happen, is that once you have a, a pecking order, it will stay like that. They'll all close up over the period of a formula um, because knowledge gets about. But at the end of the formula, it may still be the same. And then a new formula will come along. There'll be a new pecking order. And, you know, because everyone's working it absolutely flat out, the development rates are the same. Okay, so let's move on to uh, to Basil's second part of that, which he just made the throwaway comment that, well, the strolls are looking like they're selling now. Is there any any hint of that? No. None whatsoever? No, no more than the normal rumours, which is the normal rumours is that uh, Lance Stroll's not good enough and... His dad will eventually wake up to the fact that he's not good enough. Having said that, they're still going. Um, and the car company is still driving itself along, um, renegotiating its enormous £1 billion worth of debt. Try to shift £1 billion worth of debt um, and make your company a uh, much better bet financially. It's a very difficult thing to do. So... The car company I'm very wary of. The racing team, well, that's down to that's down to Lawrence Stroll's desire to be successful either for himself or for his son. And that's the interesting question. Um, the trouble is that if you ask Lawrence Stroll a question, the answer you get may not be um, a reality. What? No. I won't, I won't have it. I won't hear of such a thing. Well, you may not, but I've done it a few times, and I can tell you, it ain't <laughs> worth doing. After a while, you stop asking the question. 
because when you get the answer that patently is not the case two weeks later, you don't tend to bother trusting people anymore after that. Do you bump into to Lawrence in the paddock? He's all like, hello, Joe, how are no, things? No, we don't. We don't. We don't. We just walk past each other because I think we've gone beyond. Oh, okay. We have been in the Formula One together for about 30 odd years now. All right, no chance of getting him on Missed Apex then. Hello? None, well, shed. you could probably get him on if he if he's looking for, you know, sort of a bit of pro PR. I noticed that uh, Drive to Survive gave him a full episode and yeah. what a wonderful G- human being he was. Gave, gave him a full episode, did he? Okay. Well, he, he was able to prove what a wonderful human being yeah. he is. But incidentally, that is the first time I've ever heard him being described as a wonderful human being by anybody, anywhere, at any time. But there you are. No wristband for, for Mr. Stroll. He's much, much, much too important. Yes, yes. give that wristband to that Toto Wolf. He's a nobody. Yeah, that is exactly what happened. That yeah, is that's exactly, exactly what happened. That, that was edited, edited in that way to, to please somebody. I don't know why they want to please him, but there that's you are. So so. I, I would say, even if you're not a Drive to Survive person, just watch the first 15 minutes of that first episode to get a, a glimpse of what we're talking about there. It's he's so such a nice obvious. guy and he's so... Oh, never mind. We we fear and love him in equal measure. It was the kind of vibe that was... Yeah, fi- if you watch the fi- first 15 minutes, anyway, you can see me exchanging abuse with Gunter oh, yes. Steiner, too. Gunter Steiner, who is uh, the ambassador for the Miami Grand Prix mm-hmm. and doing post-race interviews. Uh, his his Rolodex got filled up very quickly, his calendar. <laughs> uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's not doing... At the moment, He's he's got a, a few races off. Um because he doesn't want to do it all but he's got he's got six uh German TV gigs he just did Australian TV he's got the Miami ambassador gig and i believe there's another TV station who wants him for a bunch of other things as well so um i don't think he's going well, he's not starving poor old Gunter, you know no fair he enough there has one of the most important um composite businesses in north carolina where nascar lives so i don't think he's starving and he lives in a very large house, which you might have seen on Drive to Survive. His next door neighbours are NASCAR drivers, so I think possibly he's got a couple of quid in the bank, you know. Ooh, which NASCAR drivers? I can't you know. remember. He told me once, but I can't remember which ones. But there might be IndyCar drivers too, actually, because they're Lake Norman is where the Flash people live in Charlotte. And uh, so basically your next door neighbours are either NASCAR or IndyCar drivers, but I can't remember which ones. Um, so just to divert very quickly to NASCAR... Uh, I have been invited by a team to go and hang out and make some content uh, with a NASCAR team, and it's 2311, which is the... Yo, yo, Bubba. Yeah, and also it's owned by Michael Jordan as well. And Denny Hamlin is the other co-owner, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually really excited to get up close to to NASCAR, because from what I've seen on telly and from doing it on Sims, that it is a fascinating motorsport discipline. But they have a similar effect to what F1 had a while back, where if you said to someone five years ago or eight years ago, name an, name an F1 driver, they people would go, uh, Lewis Hamilton? And they seem to have a similar thing in NASCAR, where Bubba is the only one that people can name internationally. No, I mean, I don't think that's true. Um, the thing is, they do they lost six big stars at the same time, but there are still, you know, it takes time to build. So they've got Kyle Larson, who's a... Um, pretty big name these days he's doing the indy 500 this year um as well and he's an extraordinary talent um but it's true they are they are sort of lacking the big the big um star names and the ones that they've got are uh they're not really um i don't know they're not characters in the way that the old gang were but that takes time to build characters you know so and and F1 is doing a really good job of that at the moment. As much as some people hate That's why the constant... everyone else is trying to have Drive to Survive right. their own. Yeah. You know, everyone's... everyone's NASCAR are now doing it, and, and they saw an uptick in the numbers as a result of their first series. I can't remember what it's called, but it's, you know, sort of step on the gas or step on your cowboy hat or whatever. I don't know what it is, but they, they've got something like that, and Formula, Formula 2 have got something like that, and uh, IndyCar have got something like that, and Golf has got something like that. They're actually six thinks, years behind Formula One. They're doing well. I feel like IndyCar kind of led the way a little bit on doing that that extra driver content with Hinchcliffe, and they did the loads of like really funny ads for IndyCar and getting like really making. Didn't make much of an characters. impact on me because I wasn't aware of it. So no, nope, fair enough, fair enough. But Formula One has done a great. I thought job IndyCar of it. did a very good job with the turbo powered snail. That was good. 
um, whatever it's called, a snail called Turbo, was it? I don't know. They had this kid's show about a, tur- a, a snail <laughs> yeah, yeah. who wins the Indy 500. And I thought that was I great. That. Yeah. Um, and I've watched it many times. Well, not for me necessarily, but small people like it, you know. I was going to look it up, but I'm not. So the only thing with and Aston course, Martin... NASCAR oh, did sorry. fairly... De- I just finish off. NASCAR did a fairly decent job with with uh, Lightning McQueen, didn't they? So True, true, true. The thing that I'm getting not suspicious about, but wondering about with Aston Martin is Alonso's future. So as soon as that Mercedes seat became available, making lots of noises about that, potentially there's a Red Bull seat on offer with these rumours. He's going to stay where he is for two more years. Two more years? I would is, think that, so. is that the contract he wants? And where? how long does his contract it's run? It's not a question of whether he wants the contract. It's a question of whether he can get contracts from other people. And all this chat on the internet is all very well and all this Twitter Twitterati stuff. The fact is, who actually wants him? Um, and I don't think the answer is Mercedes. I don't think the answer is Red Bull. So his best option, therefore, would appear to be Aston Martin as Ferrari, obviously, are not really interested either because they just signed Lewis. So his best option would be to stay where he is. In fact, it's a perfect position for him because he doesn't have a teammate he needs to beat. And he's got a bit of speed in hand if he slows down with age. So, you know, uh, the only slight drawback is they're going into a into a relationship with Honda. Um, oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah, awkward. but, you know, times change and the management changes and people <laughs> might just forget that he said appalling things about Honda. <laughs> but um, if not, he's in the skip. And, you know, at the age of 40, whatever he is now, that's probably fair enough. But um, I don't think the Mercedes drive is on. You know, that business in, in Melbourne with George Russell, if, it, if he was in discussion with the team, that probably didn't help, if you know what I mean. Yep. Yeah, kind of awkward. Or maybe maybe there's a decision made and that was part of it. Who knows? I just don't know what Aston Martin want when it comes to a driver because it just isn't looking good for Lance Stroll at the moment. And I was expect fully expecting at some point Alonso's pace to, to mysteriously drop off so that Lance would look good. But that's no, not- there's a limit to, to I mean, Fernando will say nice things about Lance. Um, and if Fernando screws up and he finds himself behind Lance, then he'll say what a fabulous star Lance is. But I don't think you're going to see Alonso backing off. It's not in his nature to back off, um, to let Lance win things. So um, I think this is a fundamental flaw in the Aston Martin program, which is you've got to have, in order to make it to the top of Formula One, you've got to have at least one driver who who gets it and does the job. So, a la Red Bull, they have one driver who knows how to do it, one driver who knows how to finish second after overtaking lots of people because he can't qualify properly. Um, Some teams have got two good drivers. In fact, quite a lot of teams have got two good drivers. Normally speaking, you need two good drivers to get better results because... Anyone who tells me that Aston Martin wouldn't do better with two drivers scoring more points in the Constructors' Championship is just living on cloud cuckoo land. You you need two to score well. It's definitely a place in the championship. You could definitely like say, right, Aston Martin could get an extra place in the championship. Yeah, but when tri- money's sort of no object, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, matter anymore, does it? Yeah. Except, you know, at the end of the day, at some point, somewhere along the way, Lawrence or Lance, maybe, is going to have to say to themselves, well, you know, do I really want to go on doing this? Because I am not good enough. And that's just a matter of somebody making that decision. In the meantime, you know, who knows what happens when that decision is made, whether whether Lawrence continues to want to have Aston Martin racing, even the car company. All these things are, are uh, it's up to him to, to, to do what he likes. It's his money he's burning. It's, no, it's up to him. We can't do anything about it. We All we do is look in from the outside and say, well, he's not good enough. Or occasionally he's good enough. I mean, he's not slow, let's be fair. No, he's fine. Lance is okay, but he's just not the full deal. So the idea that, that Lance will win Grand Prix, I mean, it's possible, I suppose, he could win a Grand Prix, but it's highly unlikely. It's a bit past the Melden Irish. I'm not quite that bad, but you know what I mean. Ooh, Joseph. No, but I don't mean that in terms of <laughs> crashing. I mean that in terms of the outright package. Right. In terms of him right. of him being fast enough and consistent enough and motivated enough and all these other things enough to win a Grand Prix. I just don't see it. I'm sorry. It's you know, that's based on 
35 years watching Formula One races. So um, it's not that I have anything against Lance. I mean, he's Lance, you know. So I think that when, when people go, oh, don't compare him to Pastor Maldonado, I think it's because there was an intensity with Pastor Maldonado where if he put it in the wall, he really put it in the wall. If he hit a car, he really hit a car. Plus the things he would say, he'd accuse his team of of messing with his car. He'd be very vocal and outspoken, whereas Lance comes across as very nice. So I think that's why when you compare the two, I'm like, oh, that's a bit mean. But the, the record... Well, I think, I think Pastor came across as somebody who was very hungry. Yeah. True. I don't think Lance comes across as somebody who's very hungry. Although I was impressed a year ago when he, you know, he fell off his bike and came back from that. That was impressive. But it's about the only time I've ever been impressed by Lance Stroll. That could also be like nationality based. You know, do Why? Canadians tend to get very excited and animated? Canadians don't get excited. Have you met Jacques Villeneuve? I have seen Northern Exposure, and I base all Jacques my Jacques Villeneuve is perfectly excitable. Believe me. Uh, I don't think that one works, no. The okay. idea that Canadians are all sort of frozen, their minds are frozen so they don't react. No, don't go for that, sorry. One thing you said is at some point they, they might realise that it's not working or it's not happening. I do always wonder with the money drivers, at what point something kicks in where I, I just feel like I would have so much self-awareness if I if everyone knew I was there because I was just paying to be there and then it's gone on for a long time. When you have... Drivers come in, Pedro Diniz, I don't know why, the Chilterns, they come in for a couple of seasons, they give it a go, realise it's not quite working out, and then go. But when it's with Stroll, I mean, this is the longest and, and highest up the grid we've seen this kind of overall driver package. Yeah, but some people don't live in the real world. So they don't necessarily hear the voices. They don't want to hear the voices, and if you don't want to hear things, you don't have to listen to the people who are saying it. So... I mean, there's a lot of people in Formula One who don't live in the real world. I hear the voices. Yeah, I listen but you, to them. But that's that's my point. The point is, you're you're on the outside looking in, but these people on the outside or in the inside looking out don't hear the same voices because they they live in cloud cuckoo land. I have now, voices. It's that... a cloud cuckoo land that works for them, and they're all jolly rich and all the rest of these things, but. They don't have any clue about the real world. You know, they don't know what it's like to get on an aeroplane and turn right because they're too busy getting, I mean, they even turn left, to be honest. If you're yeah. Aston Martin and you're listening to this and you're going, why doesn't that handsome presenter fight back more against Joe Sayward? Do you know what? I, with a paddock pass, I would. So I'm very, very bribable, and I just want people to know that. So if you notice it's me fighting Joe... This is very bad for your brand to sort why? of declare yourself to be bribable. Well, because why? why would people trust anything you say? Because they know I'm being honest about how bribable I am, and I've been very, no, very no, no, consistent. No, 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 no. Listen, everybody's oh. bribable. I'm, I'm, I will happily admit that I'm bribable, <laughs> but it's going to cost you... what if the rest of my career, you give me one hit worth of money. I'm not going to stay around and be bribed for years on end. Just give me a huge amount of money Once. and I'll go away. I'm bribable so stay, to go away. If you so stay like anybody a out opinion. there wants to spend X amount of money so I can retire and live happily ever afterwards, I will leave Formula One instantly. The thing is that they won't. <laughs> Aston Martin, paddock pass, and I'll fight Joe Harder on this. Okay, let's move you on. You as much uh, as you like, but then I'll just call you, I'll, I'll abuse you and say that you're biased and, and bored. And, uh, you know. Everyone does that. Uh, the, the, you read our YouTube comments, I'm fine. I'm so hardened to that, it's unreal. HLS3. <laughs> asks how bad is the situation oh I hadn't, I hadn't seen this how bad is the situation at the FIA for Mohammed Ben Salem that he has had to write his there after all of us letter this week I thought it smacked of desperation was it perceived internally as desperate or did it have some helpful impact brackets for him and then I got a link to an article from uh, RN365 and the headline there is a quote from him saying the FIA is a target of accusations against me so i'm only just seeing this for the first time i'll link to the article but um does well, that you should have of... seen it last week in the jspm newsletter because it's I... all in there if you don't read it spanners it's I not do, my I fault i do i try to but there's no pictures and i, I need the uh, pictures to keep me interested basically that kind of defense is high school machiavelli uh it's what everybody does if you're under attack from the outside you just you just blame it all on the people on the outside say it's conspiracy against the empire it's not a conspiracy against the federation it's it's not even a conspiracy against anybody it's basically because people don't want the president to be there now it's it's not necessarily 
outside attacks. There are some outside attacks going on. Obviously, Susie Wolf is one of them. But then again, she seems to think, and I tend to agree with her, that she has a case that needs to be answered. An awful lot of this stuff is coming from within the FIA because they are worried that Mohammed bin Sulaim will mess it all up and the Formula One will walk away and leave the Federation behind. And without any money from Formula One, the Federation goes out of business in about a week. So, you know, he stumbled around making making messes, and this is now it's coming back to haunt him. Now, I think they're not trying to get out get him out necessarily because it's very hard to get a president of the FIA out. You know, Max Mosley survived despite being you know, so well it's true. On the front page, I, I just of, an have to take a front page of a British newspaper and they voted, <laughs> oh, you know, gave him a confidence doesn't... vote. So what does that tell you? I just feel like there was a different way you could have described that, but uh, no, I don't think there's any different way of describing it. That was the re- well, actually, I could describe it as, <laughs> as I suppose. Everyone is hearing a lot. Of, everyone's no. just hearing a lot of beeps right now, Joe. You can you can do. It's not a swear word. To play, it's a position in rugby. Well, nobody knows because all of that is just a beep. But um, yeah, okay. I don't, I've even lost your point because I've had to sit here editing. No, the, the, the reality is that the president of the FIA can do what the hell he likes and still he will get a vote of confidence because of the situ- situation, the patronage system inside the FIA is something that is outdated and needs to be changed. Okay. Now, that's a problem. The second problem is that when the Ethics Committee came out with their report about how he was, how Mohammed bin Zulayim was not guilty. Everybody in the paddock in Melbourne laughed because they didn't expect anything else. Every single person I know, including <laughs> FIA people, laughed because he was yeah. like, oh, well, what else did we expect? That's a problem. That's a perception problem the FIA has. If people perceive the FIA not to be fair, you know, and it's silly little things like it's nothing personal and it's certainly not, you know, designed as, as, as accusing anybody. But I'm saying these are the perceptions. And, you know, so nobody would expect anything from the ethics committee. Perhaps he, perhaps they should do. But you will, you're, you're talking to a whole bunch of cynical people who just go, yeah, well, what did we expect otherwise? Now, Bin Sulayim is in serious trouble with Susie Wolf because right. that is a serious. criminal. That is a criminal case. There will be policemen knocking on the door of the FIA. Uh, there'll be policemen probably knocking on his home door at home. There'll be policemen knocking on the door of his staff. There'll be people knocking on the door of the magazine that published the article. There will be policemen doing lots of things, asking questions. And if you start lying to them, you're going to get into perjury situations. You're going to get into all kinds of stuff. There's probably conspiracy charges as well. So this is a big mess, and this is going to hurt. And this is also, you can't buy this one off. You can't, you can't settle for damages. This is a criminal case. So... I think that that's where they need to worry about. And even if, you know, even if in two years' time they win the case, the damage is already being done. So I have a question, yeah. a personal one. So it's confusing to a lot of people what Susie Wolf is, is actually suing for because the, the, the initial statement from the FIA in response to the F1 Insider, F, F1 Business Insider article was actually was fairly tame. And it said, we have received, we have, we are aware of these allegations and we are going to take them very seriously. And it seems like, is that enough to sue over? Yes, of course it is, because it's defamation. And can you explain why that defamation, no people were mentioned? No, no, it doesn't matter if people are mentioned or not. If it's clear, and, and the FIA was, I'm told, briefing people about the names of the people involved. Allegedly. Is, I did, right. They didn't brief me, but there are people who were briefed. And when they go up before a judge would say, I was briefed by such and such a person, because you don't lie in court unless you want to go to jail. And so, you know, and also one has to ask the question to the magazine in question, where did the story come from? Because it didn't come from one of the teams, because all 12, all 10 teams and the F1 group said they were not responsible and they didn't agree with it. In other words, somebody made it up or somebody told the magazine something that wasn't true. So all these people are going to get questioned by policemen, a juge d'instruction, it's called in French, and they are going to get questions as to why this happened and how this happened. And, and you know, I, I would expect some of them to tell the truth. 
And if so that I'm is the case, if that is the case, and the truth comes out as people suspect it might be, uh, as things they think it might be, it's going to be very messy indeed. So um, we'll have to see. But I think at the end of the day, is it a bad thing? Well, we'll see. We'll see if it's a bad thing or not. But I think the key issue here is that people do not have faith in the FIA's own policing, self-policing mechanisms. That's been seen by the people sort of laughing at the ethics committee results. Um, and, you know, it's not, again, you can say, well, he's just another journalist causing trouble. It's not that at all. Joe, I'm, actually, I'm actually looking in from the outside and saying, look, I can see what the problem is here. I'm actually, I'm actually in favor of the FIA as, a, as, a, as an institution, so long as it's run properly. And that's the problem. Even even Lewis Ham Lewis Hamilton in a press conference just said, "I've never had faith in the current FIA president." Pretty much, so it feels he like had, he, said yeah, he open, did say that. Yeah, yeah. I so mean that's I pretty surprising, like direct, no nonsense way to say it. It's surprising to hear a driver just say that. Well, he is employed by Toto Wolf, but that's another point. Oh, good point. No, that's a great point. No, no. I mean, he, he doesn't have to, even if he's employed, he doesn't have to say otherwise. But he feels that way because, you know, he, he he's he's had other things happen to him that he felt were unfair. Certainly. And he felt were deliberately um, aimed at him. So, you know, it'll be in, it'll be a fascinating uh, court case if it goes to court. There's no, no guarantee that it will go to court. The juge d'instruction comes up with his report and then decides from that whether or not to go to court. Um, but this is all. This will all take a, a year at least, probably, which means that it'll just be coming up at about the same time as the presidential election for the FIA next time around. Right. But having said that, by then already, all the people I've just talked about inside the FIA going, "Oh, well, this is this is not what we need. We need to change the situation." They will already have formulated their next candidate. They'll be they'll be putting together alliances, um, and this is all about this is all about. Uh, in Susie's case, it's all about getting satisfaction for what she considers to be defamation. In everyone else's case, it's you know, everyone looking at it going, let's have somebody at the FIA who's different and doesn't do these things that have happened uh, since Bin Sulaim took over. Jean Todd, in comparison, was, was a, pop, a, a fantastic FIA president. Excellent. So I'm guessing the answer to Gavin's question on this is no. Is, is there any mechanism to remove him from his post? Um, and is there any appetite yeah. to do so? There are there are mechanisms to remove him from his post, but in a system of patronage, it's very hard to do because every little motor club in the world who has something to lose by losing Mohammed will vote for him. Hence the Mosley situation in 2009. Don't repeat it. Don't repeat it. Okay. Beat Hence the broken. confidence vote in Mosley in 2000. <laughs> Incidentally, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but a, a, a party who shall remain nameless went around during that confidence vote and apparently or claims to have got 41 votes for Mosley by using his influence, the result of which he became an FIA vice president. Now, that's the patronage system written out in full. Fascinating. Should we get a more fun topic? Yes, it's boring. <laughs> Gavin, don't, don't say it's boring. This is our content. Well, I'm sorry, but the FIA politics is, is fundamentally boring. It's an organisation that, that should do its job and shut up. And unfortunately, it doesn't. I would do that, but my job is to not shut up. Exactly. So I'm Fair enough. Get on, get on and stop shutting up. Gavin followed up. Is there any truth to be con in that? To be considered a great champion, you need to have won a championship with more than one constructor. If there is, could this be a factor in a future Verstappen move? away from Red Bull. Your opinion, sir? Does it matter if you win five world championships yes. with the same team? Yes, I think it makes a huge difference. Well, you do, but if you're the champion, you don't probably think that way. I you don't care. If you've won five world championships, you don't care. Maybe, but I val personally, as a fan, like I value Sure, but you're, you're at as a fan. Yeah, well, it's a fan podcast, job. Can I, I, know, I, I accept it's a fan podcast. You asked me what I thought. I'm telling you. I'm literally wearing a T-shirt that says wrong, but first. Yes, so. I know that. But what I'm <laughs> saying is you asked me if that made an, in, in, uh, any any effect on, on a driver oh, deciding yeah, where to point. go. And yeah. I say, no, it doesn't. Why would it? I, I mean, it it, maybe if, you know, if there is more fan-like drivers 
they would go, oh, I need to win a championship in another team. And perhaps it's nice to do that too. But, you know, you don't need to. Did Fangio won all his with one team, didn't he? No. Did he not? not That's why he's a great then. Not at all. Alpha? Alpha, yes. Ferrari, Ferrari. yeah. Mercedes, oh, right, yeah. yes. Oh, really? Well, he br- jumped about even in mid-season. So one season, it's not quite sure who he was with. So, you know. Okay. Because he was with Maserati as well. So, I mean, I can't remember off the top of my head how many different... He won a different championship with everybody, frankly. Okay, but we are talking about be, to be considered like the one of the greats. There's a lot well, of Senna's champions where you go. Then. Huh? Who? Senna's not a great then. How dare you? Well, now you just said it yourself. Yeah, but he was cut short. I think, he, he obviously, I'm he would have gone. He'd have won a Williams Nicky Lauda did it with different teams. Yeah. Well, a lot of people consider him a, a great. And Prost did it with different teams. Exactly. And Bastian Vettel it, certainly didn't do it with different teams. Exactly. Now, find me someone who rates... Vettel's championships higher than Prost's. Everybody rates Prost higher than Vettel, surely. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. So I think there's some valid things to Gavin's point here that I think it, it definitely makes you look better if you can do it in more than one team. Yeah, but I don't think it's I don't think it impinges on the decision making process. Okay. I think yeah, the number the number at some point, seven world championships would be considered great, regardless of whether it was one team or multiple teams, I suppose. Yeah, then, but the, the other point worth making here is that Lewis Hamilton's done it too, so it doesn't make any difference if he does it again. He's already done yeah, it. Yeah, I think if Lewis Hamilton goes to Ferrari and wins a title, he he is nailed on the greatest of all time. No arguments. Yeah, yeah, and I expect at that point someone from Vietnam will become Pope too. It could happen. They look okay. Of course, it look, can they, happen, they but it's not a, very likely, is it? Lewis Hamilton's car just won a race. Lewis Hamilton's car just won a race. Sainz was borrowing. Why it did still. that car win a race? Because it was what, the what fr- happened Perez... in that race that allowed Sainz to win? No, no, no. Perez it was said... a Red Bull that went. Bing! Perez said that that Red Bull wouldn't have won anyway. Yeah, but that's because Perez couldn't <laughs> I know, win. I know full well that's why he said that. <laughs> but it's quite funny. But everyone thinks they were at least competitive. Yes, they're always competitive in qualifying, but in the race trim, they just fade away very quickly. So onward and upward, eh? I bet they're up there in Japan. And I'm also betting that Verstappen also has more mechanical issues in Japan. That's my, my current theory. I bet you. Why? Because he he took a swipe at the king. And when you take a swipe at the king, you can't miss. And the Verstappen swipe at the king has missed. And now Horner's in charge and he's upset. You're, you're going to tell me that Horner goes down under the under the yep. car with a spanner Sab- and loosens joints and things Sabotage. like that. Sabotage, yeah. He, what yeah. he did was he rolled up Verstappen's contract and put it in the brake duct. Yeah, so Christian like, Horner doesn't your want to win the Constructors' Championship anymore. He thinks he can win it anyway without him. Well, with Perez, do we yep. a favour? That's the biggest way to win. I said this to Brad in the week. I said the biggest way for, for Horner to ultimately win this battle is to win the championship with Perez. If you're not watching the video, you could, Joe can not, could not be less interested in continuing this conversation with me. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> okay. Silly conversations, Banner. Silly. That's, even, that's my whole job. Okay, no, well, no, 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 but that's particularly silly, you know. So. Well, we'll see. We'll see. When, when there's a, a floor correlation issue or he needs a new power unit, Remember, he's got a new power unit in there. Uh, well, yeah, when his new power unit has got a bit of a problem, Malaysia 2016 style. We'll, we'll chat again. Muna asks, what is Joe's opinion on Vowles' decision this season and over the Australian Grand Prix weekend? He claims to be changing the process, but if things are failing, behind, falling behind, and that suggests a lack of oversight and management on the operational build side of things, which could be due to a lack of staff. Obviously, a lot of uh, column inches about the Logan Sargent decision, a little bit less about yeah. the fact that they didn't have a spare car. There is, first of all, was Williams the only team not to have a spare car? I don't know. Well, there you go. You should ask that question as well. Joe, were Williams the only team to not have a spare car? I think there may have been others. I can't prove it, but I think there may have been others. Okay? The fact is <clears throat> that some teams are not as well organized as others. Some teams have got fundamental problems that take years to fix. Williams has got a fundamental problem that takes years to fix. And they haven't got the production capacity to do what they should have done and they know that and it was unfortunate that they happened to have that 
It was entirely the right decision to put the fast driver into the car that was left. It is, sorry, it's tough on Logan, but that's the truth of it. You need to try and score points at every opportunity. And if you have one driver who's quick and the other one who's not, you give it to the quick guy. So they had one car, two drivers, and they did what they had to do. It's embarrassing to have that happen, but you can't fix everything overnight, particularly with the restrictions there are on CapEx, which if you remember correctly last year, Fowles was banging on about a lot in the course of the year. We need more money. We need more money. We need more money because we're trying to catch up, but we can't because we're not allowed to spend it. But there's also a time issue and there's changing people. You know, you can look at what happened in Australia also as being a positive for the team because it means that Vowles can go home and shout at a lot of people and give them pre-45s. An excuse to start no, thinning, thinning Well, it's herd. not an excuse. It's just a, well, I told you it was going to happen and this is what's got to happen now. You know, so th- these are the, I don't know the, the ins and outs of what's going on at Williams in that respect, but I don't see, I, first of all, I don't think they're the only ones who, who, who didn't have a spare. Um, you know, <clears throat> there, there are other teams where things are just as chaotic. I mean, let's talk about Sauber pit stop, shall we? It's hor- like, to the point where I've said, like, why even turn up if they can't do? If every pit stop is forty, fifty seconds, there's no point. There's no, there's no point even turning no, up. No, there is no point in turning up. That's quite correct. Yeah, that seems really harsh. But no, no, it's not yeah. really harsh. It's the truth. So vowels, though. <laughs> Yeah, what about? I I think Vals is doing a a great job. It's not easy, and he's got a hell of a thing to fix. And this is what people don't realize: that when you have a team that needs fixing and it needs fixing a lot, it takes a long time. You can't just fix it overnight. You can't six months. You can't change everything. The reputational damage for Williams was so severe over the course of the weekend. It was a deeply unpopular decision. Even even for well, people who saw I the logic of it, that either it was a necessary. They didn't have a choice. Well, they could have had a spare car. Well, how 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 could they build a spare I car? Don't you know. think they wouldn't have done it if they could? No. So what I'm wondering now is going forward, are the teams who maybe don't always have a spare car go actually looking at the kicking Williams well, got in the press. It is now a priority to have a spare chassis. Yeah, yeah. But it's a bit like you know things change. It, it, the the opinion polls or whatever you want to call them of the fans, ultimately, because the fans don't necessarily understand the industry in the same way that the teams do. No, uh No, you're right. Well, no, no. I mean, to, to, to claim that fans understand the industry more than the teams do is a little bit pushing it, I think. But, you know, the, the fact is there are things like the, the Berman effect. The Berman effect is teams have suddenly realized that young drivers might actually do just as good a job as the old ones, and they're a hell of a lot cheaper. So that's changed the driver market. Berman arriving and, and driving that car in Jeddah has changed the driver market because people are now thinking, well, actually, why do we need these guys with experience? Maybe we have one experience, one, and one youngster because the youngster will go fast because they, they, they're they yeah. hungry. You know, so... Uh, uh, yeah. I heard someone describing a lot of the drivers as bed blockers because they, they, we sort of... I think, yeah, because there's a fear to bring in anyone new and they want the experience higher. You could sort of argue that that's why you've got Magnussen and Hulkenberg in at Haas. Yeah, you can sort of argue that if you want to. Yeah. Should we move on? I've got yeah, quest- two like- more questions, though. Two more questions. I mean, I, I was going to say, I think you'll see more young drivers coming. I think you'll see more young drivers coming this year, even. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So we did our ultimate grid for 2025, and we had quite a few rookies on it. So we had, uh, to start with, we had the Japanese driver, Isawa, Isawa, yeah. uh, who's getting a test run in Japan. Yeah. Where did uh, so you is, have is him? He, huh? Where did you have him? Where, because in our thing, uh, Verstappen was staying at Red Bull. Who did we have with him? We had signs going to Red Bull to join Verstappen. Perez out. And then we had Sonoda and... Uh, Isa- I don't want to get the name wrong. What was the no, name? You won't Jeremy? have two Japanese guys in the Why? same thing. Oh, okay. Well, it's that's more likely that one of those guys will end up at Aston Martin one day. Ah, good point. So Sonoda to Aston Martin, that's what we had as an early jump. And then we had Isawa at Visa Cash. Iwasa. Iwasa. What did I say? I said that. Isawa. Okay. Iwasa at Visa Cash. Is, that a, is he a realistic prospect? We'll see how he does in the testing. He's decently he's decently fast, but is he... Does he? I mean, it's not just about being fast as well. You know, it's about lots of other things too. 
Anyway, who else did you have on your... Poor chair. Dream on. Next one. I've lost track. And then we then we started getting into territory of bringing IndyCar drivers in. So I don't want to get yelled at anymore. But... All right. Well, you've missed out one very important gone. name. Gone. Behrman. Behrman. We had Behrman in it. No, at another one. Antonelli, we put at Williams. Okay. Sound call. Cool. Realistic call? Cool? Uh, yep. For 25? This is my point about... This is my point about... No. <laughs> For 24. Whoa. Oh, okay. That's That would be big. Dragged out of F2. Oh, well, dragged. Dragged of I his... don't think he'd be dragged. I think he would be... <laughs> he would go willingly, to, would he? ...to run, actually, and jump. But that's his first F2 season. Yeah. So to be dragged enough, out. There, there is something holding him back, however. Not beating Behrman regularly? No. Super they've only points. had They've only had a few races, and he's beaten Behrman most of the time. Um, I think you'll find that he's not 18. Oh, no. When does he turn 18? The week before the Italian Grand Prix. <gasps> the plot thickens. So, Logan only has up until the Italian Grand Prix. Yes, I would say that's a very sound call. This is my favourite bit of the show. Good. I like he's this. also Antonelli's also testing old Mercedes as of now or next week. He's just doing a whole program of stuff to get ready. They're clearly preparing him for the Mercedes drive, but it would be it would be a little bit harsh to take him in too early. And he's a teenager after all. So you want to do what they did with Max, put him in another team, and if you pay Williams enough money, because that's you know that money's always helpful. I'm sure they'd help him. The plot thickened. This makes so much sense. Okay, this is cool. So, Sergeant was on the bubble whether to get this contract or not for the next year. They gave him the benefit of the doubt last year. Okay. And And now they've still got the doubt and he's had the benefit. So, now he has to deliver. If he wants to stay in Formula One, he's got to start beating Alex Albon. And And I think I can say confidently that's not very likely to happen. No, there's absolutely no way that happened. I'm, I'm interested. I'm being, you... I'm being nicer than you are in this respect. I said, you know, he's got to do it. I, I've been. Um, I think I've seen the evidence of Logan Sargent's performances and the fact that the the thing that everyone was celebrating. And if you're a fan of Logan Sargent, I don't want to be overly ruining that for you. But when he finished behind Albon, which is really the minimum that you should be doing, is finishing just behind your teammate. That's the minimum. And he did that once last season and everybody treated it like, ah, see, there we go. He has got it. But like he doesn't, he hasn't fulfilled that minimum criteria for maintaining a seat. If he has, I can't see it. And I feel that's a fair analysis. But, you know, if you can point to me these performances, well, stints, I, I, I qualifying. I think have been very fair with him. They've, they've, they've given him all the opportunities. Okay. They took his car away from him in Melbourne, but that's another issue. Um, they've given him plenty of opportunity to show himself improving and you know getting close um and right now he's got to deliver if he doesn't deliver he'll be out and i don't think that's outrageous unfair or whatever it's just the way of the world it's a dog eat dog world out there i have to admit it's really would... the point to just oh, go back about five minutes uh the point about Behrman and antonelli that you made there is one thing you've forgotten and that is that Behrman's had a year's experience in f2 well, I was going to say that with Antonelli, which is that he's going to be dragged out of his first year of F2 and then put into F1. You know, but we have seen that before. Enough. We have seen that before. So Verstappen came in at 17 from F, straight from F3. And then they made a rule probably based on his his season there that you had to be 18. Yeah. People didn't that didn't like seeing that. Yeah. And Verstappen did take a long time to, to ramp up, though. People forget that now because he's so on it and consistent. But he was inconsistent. He was hitting a lot of people. And it, you know, people did question whether he'd come in too early. Yes, they did. But I think, you know... It worked out. The other thing is that so much of this, so much of success and failure is also in the head of the driver. So Antonelli can be screwed up by thinking it's all going to happen and it's all going to be too easy. He can screw himself up. So, you know, you have to be... You have to take into these... All these things get taken into account. You don't know how they're going to develop. I mean, someone like Piastri... He is such a solid individual that you can think, yeah, well, he's all right. He's not going to sort of get up himself or what else. But some of them do get very, very high on their own supply and they don't deliver (laughs) on what they think they can do. There's lots of, I mean, the drivers are uh, interesting beasts and they're all different. Um, 
but sometimes you can overhype people. And I think, you know, to some extent, Sargent had a very successful uh, time when he was a very young driver. And maybe he got a little bit ahead of himself in confidence terms. But he's quick. There's no question about it. He just makes lots of mistakes. If you ask Oscar Piastri about Logan Sargent, he'll tell you he's, he's very, very quick. And Oscar's a little bit bemused as to why Logan can't deliver. But right now, Logan's not delivering. And it doesn't matter with the whys and the wherefores. You've either got to do it or you don't do it. From a viewer point of view, I'd be very excited to see Antonelli come in. That would make me want to look at that Williams battle more. I would have more eyeballs on Williams if Antonelli was to swap mid-season. So that's a very well, exciting just prospect. Watch this space and see what happens and see if dear old Uncle Joe is right or wrong. Oh man, I can see the headlines now. All the say word on Missed Apex talks about Antonelli swap. Oh, we're going to get clicks, Joe. We're going to do it. We've done it. And let's direct those clicks to your media, which you produce at the Grand Prix. Uh, six hours after the race or less, you tend to have your PDF delivered into people's inboxes. It's peanuts for the whole season and you'll get all that great content. And you also have a much more expensive but insider on track yeah, uh, but the, 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 the level newsletter. Of, the level of um, uh, insider information is higher. Yeah, and Spanners. If you read it, I do read. I try to read it. It's just it's reading, and it's so there's so many things. Youth, youth of today can't read can't read more than hundred words before before getting tired and need needed to have a cup of tea. I like being called youth at forty three though. You can keep doing that. I don't mind at all. Uh, but go and check out GP Plus. Certainly, go and check that out. That that will be your and, your staple. And the JSBM newsletter, the one that costs too, more, but is very it's very too good expensive. too. It's too expensive and wordy. There's pictures in. GP Plus magazine. But we'll have links to all of those. Um, and Joe, if you could actually send me the best links for those, that would be great. Go and follow Joe on Twitter, at Joe Saywood. And make sure you follow me, please, at Spanners Ready. I am 217, I think, followers away from 20,000. And that really moves the needle when people look at our social media accounts and go, oh, look, yeah, he's followed on social media. So following us on social media really helps. At Missed Apex F1. And consider being a patron at patreon.com forward slash Missed Apex. Don't forget to message about Miami. I think it's going to be me and Matt and Christina out there. So come say hello. We'll do a panel and we'll have a jar. Until we see you next, work hard, be kind and have fun. This was Missed Apex Podcast. Missed Apex Podcast.